uh, making his luck on Sunday debut. Harry Whittington, good morning. Good morning, Nick. And, and you must feel great to, to be in a position with these these lovely horses. Yeah, no, we you know we count ourselves very lucky and hugely privileged to have such you know um, quality uh, caliber of horse. So um, yeah, it's great, and uh, you know three horses hopefully without chance you know with good chances and um it's exciting and uh, all the preparation's gone very well you know last bits and pieces of work serious work this week and um you know we can't do any more now but uh, you know wrap them in cotton wool and and hopefully turn up and run their races well everyone talks about it being a stressful time but i'd suggest to you that it's a lot more stressful if you've got nothing to go to Cheltenham with yeah no definitely i mean we've had runners there in the past and it's um you know it's it's obviously an incredibly hard place to go um, and uh, you know it's uh, you know it's it's not it's not um, you know hugely fun if uh, if if you know that you, you know you haven't got a, a chance. But you know with three going this year, you know we're just incredibly excited because um, you know all three do have solid chances, and um, I think that makes a big difference. You've now got a strong yard full of really talented horses, and. It's been a it's been a pretty tough way up from where you you, you began your, your training career. Just looking at your own your own pedigree, it was predestined for you, really, wasn't it? You would you couldn't really have done anything else. Just tell us a bit about a, a bit about growing up where where you are now. Yeah, well, it, it was um you know I was obviously very lucky, and uh, you know the yard is where where I grew up, and um, you know we we were just fortunate to you know be able to you know have ponies growing up and hunting and you know and. Uh, you know, going racing, and obviously, um, my grandfather bred, you know, point to point to hunter chases, and it was his life passion. He was obviously uh, a great friend of Captain mm. Forster's, and uh, you know, we used to get dragged up going to point to points and things, and it was uh, it was always a lot of fun. And uh, you know, and, and I suppose, you know, I was I was not not academic out of the three of us. My two siblings, uh, brother and sister, were far cleverer at school so and I was always the one that was getting run away with on the mad ponies and given the mad ponies to sort out and uh, you know so when I left school I couldn't wait to you know uh, to take up a career in, in horses and went to Australia and stayed there for a few years loved it worked for some great people uh, and uh, when I came back uh, I went to work for Malcolm Bastard and um, you know it, that was a great education and and set me on my way really to you know Starting a career with with racehorses, and for those of you who don't know, your grandfather Colin Nash was a, a a bit of a legend in in your part of the world, and gave a lot of people big chances. Yeah, he did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously, there's a, there's a long list, and you know, I suppose the, the 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 main one is Richard Dunwoody had his first winner in a Cheltenham Hunter Chase uh, on Game Trust, and uh, Luke Harvey, um, you know, Chris Maud. There was a whole heap of them, and. Um, you know, Luke is a good friend, and, and Luke always tells me that uh, you know the stories of when they were 16, get picked up by Granny and Grandpa to take them to the point to point and walk the course, and two or three shots of port before they uh, <laughs> <laughs> strolled down to the weighing room. And uh, he said, uh, you know, it was great fun, and they just the picnics, and you know, just it was a, it, it, win, lose or draw. You know, Grandpa would always have a smile on his face. You know, that was it was just you know it, it was just his passion. He loved it, and um, you know. Yeah, to be able to sort of you know uh, grow up going to point, going pointing with them, it was just a uh, you know it, it was a lot of fun and um, yeah and uh, I suppose it was only ever one thing I was going to do, and that was to train horses. And you said you went to, to to Australia for a bit. You were you were farming cattle essentially, weren't you? Yeah, we mainly. Um, but I worked for I worked for a few different horsemen. Um, if I'd hear about a good horseman that you know was sort of horse whisperer or was very good at what he he did, um, then I would look to try and get a job with him. You know, so I worked for a few different horsemen around Australia. I spent uh, 18 months in Victoria, um, five months on a cattle station in Northern Territory, six months uh, near Brisbane, and uh, a few months in South Australia, and um, and all working for. Top horsemen, and um, you know it was it was it was hard work. Um, they they, you know, they're all about graft, and um, I think there's no substitute for for hard work. And um, it was you know good foundation really for uh, because I think when you you know when you work working with horses, you need to you need to be uh, dedicated. You know, so it was uh, it was a good a good foundation really. Which was the most enjoyable part of that of that trip? Where did you learn the most? Oh uh, well, um, there was a, my first job. In Victoria, was with a fellow called John Patterson um, Paddo, and uh, he had a bit of a stud, a couple of stallions, and 
he was a well-known horse breaker and he used to have horses sent from all around Victoria. There'd be warm bloods, you know, event horses, there'd be polo ponies, there'd be race horses. And, um, you know, we'd have sort of 16, 17 horses. We'd be breaking in at any one time. And, um, you know, we used to ride away sort of 15, 16 horses in the morning. And, um, you know, he used to, uh, he used to do most of it bareback and um, you used to get on them bareback in the pen and um, with a head collar and uh, you know he used to, <laughs> we used to uh, he used to have a fair bit of bucking bronco but he you know he just said if you were you know if you're relaxed the horse will be relaxed and um, you know it, it was it was a he's a fascinating man to work for very eccentric but um, yeah a few bumps and bruises but uh, you soon learned to stay on um, I'm he guessing, was a great I'm guessing man. you haven't applied exactly the same principles. <laughs> no, no exactly. Well, actually, when I came back from Australia, when I, worked for, when I went to work for Malcolm Bastard, it was completely different. And, um, you know, the first week, I, I remember getting a, a lot of telling. I mean, I got told off a lot of Malcolm, but he was, <laughs> you know, he was the making of me. He was a great man to work for. And, uh, you know, in the first week, I remember I was just, you know, everything was done extremely disciplined from, you know, you know the way that they were breaking in, you know, leading horses to and from the the, uh, the horse walker, brushing them over, using your correct hand to brush, you know, uh, chiff knees. I mean, you know, Malcolm, his attention de detail is, is is quite unbelievable. And, um, you know, to work with these expensive horses, these race horses, you have to, you know, you have to apply that kind of detail. And uh, yeah, so it was it was very different when I went to work for Malcolm and actually. Um, you know, uh, it's obviously um, important that I learned that learned that way as well. I can't imagine you being anything other than a very diligent pupil. I, you, see, you, you strike me as a man with a great work ethic and very sensible, or is this just the image oh, you're now well, trying to portray? Um, you know, I think uh, you know. I was obviously young when I uh, when I went there, and um, you know, it just it was just it was just being sharp, sharp around the yard, and um, you know. Uh, Malcolm is incredibly good at what he does and um, you know obviously yeah so for those who don't know Malcolm yeah Bastard, he essentially prepares a, ho a lot of horses for the sales I yeah mean, I mean I'm, his I'm... sales but also you know his I think his main business now is pre-training yeah. and um, you know the list of um, you know uh, horses that come through that operation mm. is endless for you know going on to win all sorts of big races and classics and all sorts. And so he worked for his, a lot of the big new market trainers. Yeah, no, no, yeah, absolutely. You know, John Gosden, William Haggis has a great association with, but, um, you know, he also has a great association with the, with um, some top owner breeders like the Oppenheimers, the Banfords, you know, uh, Strawbridge. And, and um, you know, and so the list of, you know, um, horse quality animals that are going through is, is endless and um, you know the job has to be done properly when you're dealing with those types of horses and you know the, at the attention to detail was, was, was fantastic and, and for me to, to, to work for him for three years it, you know it was, a, it was a great foundation to be you know going and setting up on my own mm. um, because you know you, you, do, you do if you want to you know do the job properly it's, it's um, it, the attention de to detail is very important you see, um, you see, the thing that strikes me about you, Harry, is that you had a, a, essentially a thriving business going when you started on your own. And you had the yard filled up, you had tons of horses from Nicky Henderson, things going great. And you suddenly decided to junk it all to set, yeah. to set up training with five horses. I mean, what? Yeah, that's right. You have to be mad, surely, well, to I am do that. Mad, so that's fine. I always tell people I'm mad. Um, you know, I suppose I'm just, I would. You know, I would have always regretted it if I didn't try. And, um, you know, having that association with Nicky was fantastic. And, you know, the, 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 from, you know, I did five years of pre-training. The last two years we were a satellite yard, so the horses were running and racing, uh, running in races. And, you know, I suppose where I got to is I'd learned as much as I th thought I could learn. And mm. I felt that I was ready to give it a go. And not only was I, um, you know, obviously looking after all those horses for Nicky, but I'd started doing a bit of buying and selling. And um, through the help of J.D. Moore, um, who I've built an association with, um, and we bought a horse called John Spirit, um, who probably remember, mm. one of Paddy Power. For John Joe. Almost one, two, I think he was fifth, fifth in the King George. And we, we bought him and sold him, uh, the Breeze Up. So I was doing a bit of buying and selling, and I felt that, you know, that, um, that if, if I could 
go to the sales and find the right types of horses then and, and I have a lot of belief in what I've learned from Malcolm Bastard and Nicky Henderson that it would hold me in good stead and that I just had to believe and you know and just give it a go and see how it went but yeah it was looking pretty grim at the, at the end of that first winter and uh, it was just really fortunate that um, I had a horse there all winter that I felt was definitely um, you know my make um, or else it was going to be break and um, you know Dubai Kiss um, I mean you know he just he had an engine and you know I felt that he would run well in a mile and a half junior bumper and there was a, a race that Kid Cassidy won um, at Newbury in March as a four-year-old and I thought that would be ideal for him and he duly won and that sort of set, set me on my way really. And what price was he? 100 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had 60 quid on him to win, that's literally all I could afford, um, but anyway, it was, it was a great day. Um, it took me about 10 days to come down off my cloud, but anyway, it was, uh, it was fantastic. And, you know, we, we, we obviously managed to syndicate him, sell him, you know, I owned half of him, so that just brought me in a bit of income, put in a little round gallop and um, sort of just went from there, really. Um, and then the next, the next one that came along was Arzal, um, who obviously... Uh, you know, was was hugely important for us. Uh, Arzal uh, and his story embodies everything that's that's wonderful about the sport and everything that's very difficult about it as well. Mm, because he absolutely he started to make you, and then you lost him. Uh, that must have been a pretty low moment. Yeah, it was because you know, obviously when he when he won at Aintree, um, you know, it was it was just the most unbelievable feeling, and um, we just couldn't really believe it. You know, it was. Three years since I started training, and uh, you know, to win a Grade One at Aintree, and you know, it was it was just unbelievable. I had everyone there, you know. I think in the last furlong, my mum turned around to me and said, just said to me, your grandfather would be so proud, and it was quite emotional. But you know, it was it was a quite quite a heavy couple of nights in in Liverpool. I remember that, and um, well, can't remember that, was, uh, and. Uh, yeah, so it was the biggest extreme to the lowest extreme. You know, obviously, you know it was it was it was it was horrendous losing him. Um, you know, because he'd given us so much. Um, but unfortunately, it's part of the game. It's the hardest part of the game. But um, we'll always remember him because you know he was a, he was not only an exceptional horse, but he was a good friend. And you now have a, a yard named after him, don't you? We have a barn named after yeah. him. Yeah, and the other barn's named after the Bay Kiss. So, <laughs> so. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, if uh, perhaps if we get a, a winner this week, we can rename a new one. But uh, anyway, we'll see. But yeah, no, it's uh, it's. I think it's important to, you know, mark uh, rem remember these horses, and you know, naming a barn after them is, uh, you know, is it seems a, a logical thing to do. And in their own ways, whatever these horses, this week, next year, the year after, do for you. Those two, Dubai Kiss and Arzal, you wouldn't be where you were were it not for them. No, that's that's absolutely right. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, it's such a shame with Arzal because he, you know, he, he was he was he was very tricky to train early on. I mean, I went to ride him out in France and um, I could hold, couldn't hold one side of him. And I thought because he'd finished second in two races in the provinces and he was far too keen and headstrong. And I thought, you know, it looked like he's got an engine, but he just needs to learn to relax. And uh, I went to ride him out and um, couldn't hold one side of him. But I thought, this horse has got an engine, you know, and, uh, and he wouldn't look out of place down in Seven Barriers. So, so I, Tony Holt has been very good to me and has got horses with me and had horses with me now for, since we bought ours, Al, and um, he's been very loyal. Uh, you know, I said to Tony, you know, you need to buy this horse. And, um, yeah, so we got him home and he was just, he, was just, he wanted to do everything, you know, 100 miles an hour. Uh, he was a young, sort of, you know, keen type that just wanted to get on, get on with life. And um, you know, it was a few hairy moments at home trying to train him, keep him settled. But eventually, when he started going chasing, everything started to fall into place. And that particular race, you know, he was, he was, he was going a gallop, but he was just hacking along because mm. he was just so relaxed. And um, you know, uh, although. You know, he, he beat some obviously very top performers that day, like Sizing John, Aso, Lammy Surge. Um, you know, we did think outside the box in terms of missing Cheltenham and turning up at this race, whereby you know every single uh, opponent has run at Cheltenham. So, 
you know, we, we won a grade one by thinking outside the box. Yeah. We're, not, we're not necessarily saying it was a better horse, but I think off the back of that win in the following season, I think he would have gone to, you know, better things, or I think he would have held his own in, in, in a senior company because, you know, he, he was only just getting the hang of things. Such a shame, but you've got that wonderful, wonderful memory to, to treasure for, for the rest of your career, and hopefully some more memories to treasure will be created this week. When Gavin Sheehan was sitting in that seat three weeks ago, I think it was, he was purring about, about Rouge Vif. Yeah. Do you share his purr? Um, yeah, I do. I mean, you know, he's, he's Gavin's obviously, uh, um, you know, has stated that he's his favourite horse, uh, and, um, you know, he just so happens that he's the trainer's favourite horse too, because I ride him out every so day. So what is it about him that you love so much? Um, well, it's, it's funny because he's, he's as quiet as a lamb in the stable. I mean, he's literally, uh, butter wouldn't melt. He's, he's, he's absolutely soft as anything in the stable. Um, and uh, when you get him on a gallop, when you get him on a race, he'll just give 110%. He's, he's a freak. Like, so he's, he's perfect, really. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's quiet yeah. as a mouse when sleeps. you want him to be, and then he's a, yeah. a lion when you want him and to be. And when he gallops, he just, and he just, you know, he, that's, that's him. He just, um, and, and, you know, he puts so much into it, and, um, you know, he wears his heart on his sleeve, and I, th I think hopefully you could say the same about Gavin and I, and, and um, it, Gavin and him are just, a, you know, they're a proper match, aren't they? And, um, you know, he, he's obviously done nothing wrong, form's very solid, um, but it's going to be very tough. It's a wide open Arkle. I think it's a very good Arkle. Um, you know, just because it's wide open doesn't mean to say it's not, you know, mm -hmm. a very decent Arkle. There's plenty you can make a case for, but uh, hopefully he's, he's one you can make a case for. Um, the other two horses you run have both had excellent seasons in their own way. Simply the bets, have you still got a, a dilemma with him as to whether you run him in the plate or the, or the marsh? Um, no, I think I think he's. You know, the plan is for him to run in the in the plate because obviously, uh, itchy feet is in the marsh, and um, you know, he has progressed through handicaps this season. He is obviously favourite, and he's got a favourite's chance hopefully. And uh, you know, it makes sense for him to, you know, stay in a handicap uh, when hopefully he might have a bit more to give off 149. So. Um, yeah, like, you know, it, this was impressive, obviously, and the form's very, very strong. The third horse bolted up at Kempton next time out, and they think a lot of Imperial Aurus, and he's obviously favourite for the Close Brothers. I don't, it's not the Close Brothers anymore, is it? Well, it's it's the, the Northern yeah, Trust, that's I right. think, yeah, is yeah, it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, I've been saying Close Brothers all winter, so... I know yeah, what you so, mean. Yeah, Everyone yeah, knows yeah. what you mean. The Northern Trust. So, yeah, um, you know, it's solid form, and, uh, you know, hopefully... It, it just makes sense, I suppose. You know, he's the unexposed kind of novice, the, the one you could make a case that's mm. the unexposed horse in the race. But, you know, he's now, obviously, with the how well he won last time, going up nine pounds, going into, you know, punching with the big boys in a handicap against the senior um, handicappers, it's not going to be easy. But, uh, but you know, he, I think the jumping is the key. Last time, he was very, very good. And if he can jump as well as he did mm. the last day, then hopefully he'll have a, a great shout. And, and San Calvados hasn't been talked about as a likely Ryan a, a winner by too many people. Would you want, like to plead his case now? Um, yeah. Well, it, you know, it's again, it's going to be incredibly tough. Some, you know, some, you know, it's a strong renewal. Obviously, Aplus Tard is, you know, looks the one to beat, and Frodon, obviously, last year's winner, but. You know, my horse is still relatively unexposed. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy to think that, I, know I always bang on about it, but, you know, to only be seven in his third season of chasing, you know, he won his first chase at Newbury as a four-year-old, and we only stepped up and tripped for the first time in the last race at, on New Year's Day. So um, he's, he's running around the track all season. He's enjoying it. He's thriving running around there. Obviously, we got beaten by a thousandth of a second on New Year's Day, giving fifteen pounds to the winner, which is a real <laughs> so gutter. No, no mean effort, that. But yeah, but like obviously, old Grangewood, solid uh, handicapper, and um, giving him fifteen pounds, you know, you'd like to think that he's entitled to have a go, Definitely. you know, in this race. And um, you know, he could stay further next year. We, we don't know yet. Um, obviously, riding him in a different way this year has, has, has worked as well, which is great because we didn't know whether it would work until we tried it in October, which is what. The race we're watching there, so to be ridden a different way, you know, obviously he showed that he stays the strip mm. trip well. Um, 
you know, if he can improve another few pounds on what he did on New Year's Day, then, you know, hopefully that puts him in the mix. So, if it, if it doesn't work out, they, they run well, but you don't come away with a winner. Is it abject disappointment or um, do you just accept oh, yeah. that I mean, it's... Yeah, no, it's, 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 uh, it's disappointment, but, um, but the disappointment fuels, you know, how you're going to work out, how you're going to come back and compete again. And, and you know, it, you, you do go away feeling incredibly disappointed, but, you know, it, it's, it is what it is. And um, there's always another day and you're not defined by this, this, this occasion, this particular race, because, you know, there, there are always opportunities in racing down the line. And... Um, you know, as long as they all come back in one piece, um, you know, who knows, they could improve and end up winning next year or whatever it might be. So, you know, I, last, you know, Cheltenham wasn't a, a great track for us until this season. We've only had one uh, runner there finish out the first four uh, this season. So it's, it's been a huge turnaround. I think we'd only had a third and a fourth before at Cheltenham in any meeting. So uh, this year they've been you know, we've been enjoying going there and the horse has been thriving going around there. And, you know, we've been walking away in the past thinking, how, how, do, we, how do we do it? How do we conquer? But, you know, at the end of the day, when you get beaten, racing's about hard knocks. You brush yourself off and um, you work out how you're going to come back and compete the next day. Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online. And don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from 9 o'clock with the best guests.